Richard Bonning was born in Epping, New South Wales in 1930 and gave his first concert as a pianist with a symphony orchestra in Sydney at the age of 13, playing the Greek piano concerto. He came to opera by accident. An accompanist at the Sydney Conservatorium's opera school was missing one day and Bonning was conscripted from his piano class to deputize. He quickly became the regular pianist of the opera school. One of its students, who sang at the benefit given for him when he won a scholarship to study piano at the Royal College of Music, was Joan Sutherland, who later went to London, used him as a coach and finally married him. His conducting career also began quite accidentally. Mrs. Bonning Sutherland was singing in a concert in Rome. The conductor fell ill, his deputy fell ill, and the completely unschooled Bonning took over. His official debut as a conductor came at the Hollywood Bowl in 1962, again accompanying his wife. And it must be said that at first some people mischievously referred to him as Mr. Sutherland. Admittedly, Lucia with Sutherland was the opera he used as a springboard. He made his Metropolitan Opera debut with it fully 20 years ago, on the 12th of December 1965, and not in 1970, as the reference books will have it. It didn't take him long to establish himself as a major conductor. His many recordings of music, quite unconnected with his wife, or even with opera, bear testimony to that. His elevation to artistic and musical director of the Australian Opera in 1975 was deserved, whether Sutherland was a factor or not. The immense variety of operas he has conducted in Australia during the past 10 years proves his great talent. I'm not a big planner. I, I think uh, my, my talents don't lie in that direction at all. I did what I felt was right at the time. Uh, I've always chosen repertoire, chosen the, the, the f because of the, the people involved. I think, you know, if you have a lot of singers that can sing a certain opera, then it's much better to do that opera than, than to try and force them, them into the mold which you think you would like to do. And uh, I, when I came here the first time, which was 1974 back, and then I, I was musical director, I think, from 75, um, there were a lot of, of young and, and good singers, good young voices in this company, and I think it was important to find out s operas in which they could star and, and become stars for the Australian public. And I think, in, to a certain extent, one, one achieved this. Um, sometimes one was criticised for putting on operas which people said were my personal taste, but I don't know that that's r substantially true. What I think I did was to... to to open up the repertoire here. I think it was a little in the doldrums. I think it was very, it was very German-oriented, which is, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, except that I think there are many other operas. There wasn't enough Italian repertoire, not, not enough French repertoire. There was very, very little 18th century repertoire. And I tried to bring some of that back into the, into the, um, to the rep, and, and to bring back pieces which the singers could sing. I think it's, there's nothing worse than seeing singers up on the stage trying to sing operas which are beyond them or for well, a company to do operas which are beyond the It took the you, um, it would take anybody, uh, at least a couple of years... Oh, it didn't to, happen in a day. <laughs> to, ..to get familiar with uh, not only what's available in the company, but what's available in Australia. But um, a lot of singers must have, um, how can I put it, acquired a certain amount of star status during your years. I mean, uh, are there any that, that particularly spring to your mind that, that, that have developed well, during you know, your years I, here? I was very proud, first of all, uh, if, before I get on to the young singers, I mean, bringing back some, some of the Australian singers who were singing abroad. Um, singers like Heather Begg and, and Clifford Grant, who, who, were, who were singing abroad, not always in major roles, but, but were very, very valid artists. And, and they came back uh, when we came to Australia. And, and I think they brought a great deal into the company. And I'm, I very likely will forget many names that I should mention. But then, when it comes to the young singer, perhaps the one I'm very proud about is, is Isabel Buchanan, because she, she came to me, her, her teacher rang me when I was in Covent Garden, it was the last night of Norma, which I was doing there with Joan, and um, he said, I've got a singer I want you to hear, and I said, for crying out loud, it's a bit late in the, the day, I'm leaving town tomorrow, he said, please hear her, he said, she's in London and she'd, she'll come and see. I said, all right, send her along before the performance. And she came in and she sang for me, Casta Diva. This girl is just out of conservatory. She hadn't really sung publicly. She sang Casta Diva and Don Ana Aria and uh, something else. And uh, I was quite bowled over because the, the quality of voice was so beautiful and the control was exceptional. 
and um, I recommended the Australian Opera that they give her a contract, which they did for three years. And uh, she came here and she, she had some, some very remarkable successes with her. We did some wonderful Paminas and, and Gildas, and, and Fra Diavolo especially, she was enchanting in that. another singer who's come along immensely well. I, we did just the other day a big concert in Perth and, and she sang some big duets with Joan and some big major arias and, and had an enormous success. And that's a girl really to be treasured because of, it's a very, very beautiful voice. Well, Jenny case. McGregor. Mm -hmm. one, we, she, of course, had a, a marvellous thing happen to her. It's the sort of thing people read about. Um, she became a star overnight, as they, as they like to say in the newspapers. Um, she'd had a lot of experience beforehand, but, but when Joan Carden unfortunately had an, an automobile accident, Jenny McGregor stepped into to the hamlet of Thomas at very short notice, and of course, I would, would say almost walked away with the show. She had a, a very big success, and that, that put her right on, on the road to stardom. So the, there've been quite a few. There are many, many more, of course. It's been wonderful to see the development of certain singers. You know, Anson Austin, who started from being a, a, almost a light tenor, has gone to, to be able to, to command the, the most extraordinary roles, like the, 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 the very difficult tenor part in Le Ugano, the difficult tenor part in, in Semiramide, in Ipuritani. These are operas which one has trouble casting even in the very major houses of the world. And, and we were very proud to present those operas in, in Australia. When you came to Australia, um, you made some remark about um, continuing a policy which I believe you said was started with John Winter of bringing in the best people on the production side. Now, um, mm -hmm. you did, and um, there have been some wonderful, I mean, I know I've been internationally many times during these years, and mm -hmm. I, I, I really truthfully believe that the Australian opera during the last 10 years has been as good as most companies outside the great ones of, say, La Scala or Metropolitan. But have we developed any producers or designers or, or, or uh, conductors, for example, during those years? Oh, I think so, yes. I, I think people like uh, Christian Fredrickson has done a lot of very good designing for the Australian Opera. And, uh, well, the, with the conductors, you have uh, Stuart Chandler, who's doing marvellously well now. Um, I don't think one can expect to suddenly produce ten stars in, in ten years in every field. I mean, it, it's not quite as, as, as easy as that. 
But uh, I think we have many talents in this country. I think some of them perhaps are underused. Well, um, I mean, some, some of them need to be given the chances. I'm not sure whether the national company is the place where they should all start their learning. I think a lot of them should get outside and get experience, even uh, in, in the back of beyond, but, but do something before they come into the major companies. I don't think Australian opera is, is a, a place for experimentation. No, that is why I have, I mean, I'm very unpopular for it, I'm perfectly aware. I don't believe it's the place to put on all these as new Australian operas that one is trying to, f in, while one is trying to find a good one. I mean, it's all very well, you look at a score on paper, who's to say it's any good or not any good? Only the public will say it's any good eventually. And uh, I think those things have to be tried elsewhere because they cost an enormous amount of money to prepare, to put on, and then the public stays away in droves and money is lost. And an opera, to stay alive, must earn money. I mean, one, one hopes to get it from the government, one hopes to get it from the private sector, but I think an opera house also must earn a lot of money. They have to fill the seats. And I think to fill the theatre is one of the prime motives of, of any opera director. Sure. Yes. I mean, I just have to Thank manage you. as best I can. It doesn't John. seem to matter how you place the chair. Well, with the chair. Well, they look very good this morning. Um, Jenny and Chris, can you make sure that you do find each other before you go up on the stage for the, for the, for the play? Does that make sense? Yes, I can do that. Mm. Well, I think it would help us a bit. Just fine, Jennifer, so that we see you actually going together. Good. Okay, we'll come to the room for the other heads. So change, please, Bruce. John Copley's, I, th I think he's one of the people that I'm glad to have had working in the opera for so, so much because, you know, he, he added, he adds a great deal. He's very experienced, he has a great memory and he has a great feeling for singers. He understands the musical problems as well as the dramatic problems. And he's interesting. He doesn't let things get dull on the stage. And yet he's not one of these whiz kid producers that, that must keep things moving in every bar. I've, I've done productions with, with, with people. They won't, they won't leave the music alone. They won't let anybody stand for a second and sing an aria. They have to be doing something all the time. And that can become, become very, very, very irritating. You know? And Copley can be the understudy for every part in the opera, too. Oh, he generally knows them all and will sing no, them. I'm in fact, you have, them, you yes. have to stop him singing the music. <laughs> you completely up make. the wall, I tell you. I thought the, listeners, <laughs> the viewers might like to hear yeah. about Copley singing. I oh, think yeah, it's he, tremendous. But no, but it's Mouse of a producer who knows the, knows the text. He knows all the words of all the parts, generally. I, I've just come across a recording of Toscanini rehearsing Traviata, in which he sings. He's a big singer, part. too. Yes, he was a big singer, <laughs> well, too. We all have a bit of a sing sometimes. I always say to my, my wife, to, tells me to shut up, you know, to stop making such a racket. So I tell her, well, all right, I'll sing at the orchestral rehearsals, because nobody's got the guts to tell me to shut up there. I haven't heard your voice on a recording yet, as I you're have Toscanini's. You're lucky, you're lucky. As <laughs> I've heard Toscanini's. I'm, I belong to the old crow variety of singer. Terrible, terrible sound. What about this um, um, beautiful bounty that you produced for audiences in Australia in terms of uh, operas which we almost certainly would not have seen but for you? I'm thinking particularly of Huguenot. Huguenot of Maivet once upon a time was the great uh, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary thing that in the 19th century it was played everywhere mm -hmm. all the time and then suddenly dropped from the rip. 
And then in, in, in this century, people have been frightened of it. They think, oh, it was the opera of seven stars and it's not possible to put it on. But to my way of thinking, I don't think it's any harder to do an, a good Huguenot than it is to do a good Aida. In fact, it, probably the Aida is tougher in, in many ways to do a really superb performance. I, I was quite proud of the Huguenots that they did at the, at the Australian Opera. I think we cast it very well all, all the way down the line. And, and some of our, our star singers were, were in smaller roles. And uh, I, I, my only regret there, and I'm regretting is a, is a waste of time, of course, is that it never got to television because it's, it's, it's sad that there is no record of that. I don't believe that all art has to be serious in content. Well, your well, wife has proved that, hasn't she, with the Merry Widow and <laughs> oh, the Fader Mouse, and this year she's going well, to do she, Daughter she of the Regiment. Well, she loves the operas in which she doesn't have to die. And uh, I, I think in, in The Daughter of the Regiment, she's had a lot of fun. She had a, a, a marvellous production made for her by Sandra Sequi, who we're very lucky to have come out to recreate it for her here. Oh, good. And um, she did that at the, the Metropolitan, and, and originally Covent Garden, and the Metropolitan, and then Chicago and, and Vancouver, and she's been all over the place with it. And she's always had a lot, lot of fun doing it. Although it's fun, it's actually quite a grueling little opera. It's very oh, difficult. Very difficult. Very difficult. It's, it's nice and short. You get home and get your supper quite early, which is, makes it one of my favourites. Well, anyone <laughs> who saw in Fledermas would certainly want to see that. She, yes, she likes Fledermas. So that's, that's, that's a nice part of her. Stop! At the Villa Orlovsky, every lady has the right to cover or uncover as much as she pleases. Do not be alarmed, madame. I wonder if she is really Hungarian. Oh, she is Hungarian. <laughs> but can she prove it? The music will prove it. In the melodies of my homeland, and the words of my beloved language. Thank you, darling. <laughs> I think I might switch the subject for a moment. Whatever you uh, like. Uh, I have a bee in my bonnet about yourself being second only, if you forgive the expression, to John Lunchbury in terms of conducting ballet music. Well, he's had a lot more practice out of it than I have. Exactly. Um, Why? Well, because I've been so concerned with opera all the time. I've, I, and most of the ballet conducting I have done has been for, for records. And I've enjoyed that very much, and I've, I've gotten through a fair amount of repertoire. I have been invited to conduct a ballet in the theatre, but, the, you know, the ballet companies make up their minds so, so late that I've missed out. And uh, one thing that I very much regret, I was asked to conduct a new production of Giselle, which I have to love Giselle, at, at, um, for, the, for the Kirov in, in Leningrad. When Anton Dolan was still alive, he was doing a new production there. And uh, I was unable to accept that and, 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 uh, because of previous engagements, and I, I regretted it very much because uh, I love Giselle. I'm recording it again, do you know, can you believe? Uh, we're recording a lot of things twice because of this, the new compact in discs and the new, new methods of recording, which are so ex extraordinary. So I'm looking forward to doing that again. I, think right. it, I happen to think it's a great piece of music, apart from a great ballet.
Well, I hope you continue for a long time for the sake of record lovers. Well, I hope I continue <laughs> for a long time, period. <laughs> well, my grandfather lived to be, my great-grandfather lived to be 96. Well, why shouldn't you? <laughs> as long as I've got my marbles, I'll be happy. Well, uh, is there any um, interest, if I might put it that way, on your part in, in enlarging your repertoire in terms of conducting? I mean, it's different areas. I always areas. like to, I like to, to, to find new operas, yes. Um, how far I would go, I don't know. It would depend on, on what opportunities arose. I mean, I've Have you come back to opera now? Yeah. I'd mean, I, I put you on to ballet you're, music. You're, you're on to ballet. I'm trying to well, go in, away. I mean, in, you, we in, know you're interested in opera. But you see, in, in ballet music, the, the interest is very 19th century. I, uh, it's, it's, what about uh, Beethoven? Well, Beethoven? No, it's Beethoven, you know. <laughs> I think there are plenty of great conductors of Beethoven yes, know, without my getting into the act somehow. I've, 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 I've always that? felt that, you know. I, I like to do things that I can do very well and know that I have a chance of doing as well as the next person. When I listen to great, great recordings of Beethoven by the very great masters of the past, I think, well, well I don't think I have anything more to add there, so I don't you, want to do it. I think that you have made your own field and you've made a, a tremendous success. Sometimes I think, you know, I would like to perhaps do some of the, the Strauss operas, the Richard Strauss operas and, and things like that. And then other things, other times I think, oh no, I'm too old to, to get into those things. But who knows? I have a very open mind about things and I take life as it comes and, and uh, hope to enjoy it. And, and who knows what I'll do. I, I just, I like dancers and I like singers and I, I think the conductor, it, it's up to him to make life a little easier for them, to make it possible for them to express themselves to the, mo to the utmost of their ability. I don't believe in star opera conductors. I think if you want to be a star, get up on the concert platform and be a star. If you want to be an opera, company, opera conductor, make the singers the stars. They are the stars of opera. They should be, not the producers and not the conductors. I, honestly, that's such a good line. I th really think that you couldn't have a better exit line than that. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm always glad to get off the box. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Richard Bonning was born in Epping, New South Wales in 1930 and gave his first concert as a pianist with a symphony orchestra in Sydney at the age of 13, playing the Grieg Piano Concerto. He came to opera by accident. An accompanist at the Sydney Conservatorium's opera school was missing one day and Bonning was conscripted from his piano class to deputise. He quickly became the regular pianist of the opera school. One of its students, who sang at the benefit given for him when he won a scholarship to study piano at the Royal College of Music, was Joan Sutherland, who later went to London, used him as a coach and finally married him. His conducting career also began quite accidentally. Mrs. Bonning Sutherland was singing in a concert in Rome. The conductor fell ill, his deputy fell ill, and the completely unschooled Bonning took over. His official debut as a conductor came at the Hollywood Bowl in 1962, again accompanying his wife. And it must be said that at first some people mischievously referred to him as Mr. Sutherland. Admittedly, Lucia with Sutherland was the opera he used as a springboard. He made his Metropolitan Opera debut with it fully 20 years ago, on the 12th of December 1965, and not in 1970, as the reference books will have it. It didn't take him long to establish himself as a major conductor. His many recordings of music, quite unconnected with his wife, or even with opera, bear testimony to that. His elevation to artistic and musical director of the Australian Opera in 1975 was deserved, whether Sutherland was a factor or not. The immense variety of operas he has conducted in Australia during the past 10 years proves his great talent. I'm not a big planner. I, I think uh, my, my talents don't lie in that direction at all. I did what I felt was right at the time. Uh, I've always chosen repertoire, chosen the, the, to open up the repertoire here. I think it was a little in the doldrums. I think it was very, it was very German oriented, which is, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, except that I think there are many other operas. There wasn't enough Italian repertoire, not, not enough French repertoire. There was very, very little 18th century repertoire. And I tried to bring some of that back into the, into the, um, to the rep and, and to bring back pieces which the singers could sing. I think it's, there's nothing worse than seeing singers up on the stage trying to sing operas which are beyond them.
or for well, a company to do operas which are beyond demand. It took demand. you, um, it would take anybody uh, at least a couple of years. Oh, it didn't to, happen in a day. <laughs> to, to, to get familiar with uh, not only what's available in the company, but what's available in Australia. But um, a lot of singers must have, um, how can I put it, uh, acquired a certain... The, because of the, the people involved, I think, you know, if you have a lot of singers that can sing a certain opera, then it's much better to do that opera than, than to try and force them, them into the mold which you think you would like to do. And uh, I, when I came here the first time, which was 1974 back, and then I, I was musical director, I think, from 75, um, there were a lot of, of young and, and good singers, good young voices in this company, and I think it was important to find out operas in which they could star and, and become stars for the Australian public. And I think in, to a certain extent one, one achieved this. Um, sometimes one was criticised for putting on operas which people said were my personal taste, but I don't know that that's r substantially true. What I think I did was to... to